I'm Joanne Hulbert. This is Ben Claxon. We were the two who ushered Nathaniel Philbrick through Holliston on his tour in his research work. Uh, lucky him. <laughs> so we were able to show him quite a bit about Holliston. Probably um, our introduction for him took much, much longer than George's actual visit here. So um, we did not have, even have to stretch it out, but we did have him uh, take a look at what is left in Holliston that George might have seen. And there is actually quite a bit. And there's some interesting twists and turns. Oh, there's uh, maybe a few little surprises for you about just what George did and what he saw and where he went. But we will see all that as we go along on this little, little trip through Holliston with George in spirit. Now, how many of you, yes, the other day, yep. And the thing is that, um, how many of you did read the book? How many of you would like to read the book? <laughs> <laughs> well, after this, I certainly hope that you do read the book because uh, it's not only about Hollison, it is in there, but it is a wider picture of why George Washington was here why did he take this road? I mean, this is just strange, but I know that a few of you who have read the book do know why he took this road. So, and we will travel along it with him, at least from Sherbin to beyond. So, what I'm going to start by talking about is exactly what George wrote in his diary. Uh, after his uh, visit to Hollis, it's kind of like his Yelp review. So, uh, <laughs> anyway, um, November 6, 1789. It was a Friday. A little after seven o'clock, under great appearance of rain or snow, we left Watertown and passing through Needham, which is now Wellesley, five miles thereon, we breakfasted at Sherbin, which is 14 miles from the former, then passing through Holliston, five miles, Milford, Six more, Menden, four more, and Uxbridge, six more. We lodged at one Taft's, one mile further, the whole distance of this day's travel being 36 miles. As you notice, he didn't mention anything about Holliston specifically, but it is along the road that we now know as Route 16. Upon the whole, it may be called an indifferent road, diversified by good and bad, cultivated and in woods, some high and barren and others low, wet and piney. Grass and Indian corn is the chief produce of the farms. Rye composes a part of the culture of them, but wheat is not grown on account of the blight. The roads in every part of this state are amazingly crooked to suit the convenience of every man's fields and changed. the directions <laughs> ignorant. Proceeded to <clears throat> Waltham, we, could, we should in 13 miles have saved at least six. Oh, for heavens, you know. Uh, the, the distance, the, the distance the road from Watertown to Sherbin, going within less than two miles of the latter, Waltham. In other words, he's going all over the place like this. The clouds of the morning vanished before the meridian sun, and the afternoon was bright and pleasant. The house in Uxbridge had a good external appearance for a tavern, but the owner of it being from home and the wife sick, we could not gain admittance which was the reason of my coming on to Taft's, where though the people were obliging, the entertainment was not very inviting. So as you can see, he didn't have a really jolly good trip along this way. Uh, we do have enough history to know for sure that he did come this way. And how much do we find in Holliston history exactly about him being here? Luckily, there is a smattering of information. But, like most history of the time, well, fact, fiction, folklore, all mixed up, and you be the judge or you accept what it is that you would like to accept. But we do know that he was here and we do have people who mentioned it and wrote it. That, yeah, they saw him. Yeah, he was here. But then he kept going. But he was here, so that's what's really important here. So, what I want you to do, first of all, you know, very quick, this is very quickly, but it's going to be sort of a visual thing. Um, you're George Washington, what route would you take? Now, we're not going to go all the way back to Waltham or even to Needham, but we're going to start in Sherbin because right in Sherbin, 
the street, Route 16, starts as Washington Street. Okay, so that's a good starting point anyway. So what you would do is, now next time you take your car and you're driving this route, think about this. Let's go George's route, how he had to go, because it's not exactly how you see it today. You start up on Washington Street. You come by uh, First Parish Church, the library, town hall, and, ca and carry along on Route 16. You come up that S-curve going up the hill known as Scudder's Hill. Now you get to the top of the hill, and you're going to have to bear to the left onto Greenwood Street, because mm -hmm. that's the way George went. <coughs> Double down <coughs> Greenwood Street to the end, down to Woodland. Take a right and then a quick left onto Ash Lane. Travel to the end of that and you're going to take a right onto Mill Street and you're going to stay straight. Don't go Western Avenue, you're going to go straight along and you're going to come to Holliston by way of the town line of Sherbin and Holliston on Whitney Street. And you're just going to come out there and uh, end up coming out to Washington Street as we know it. So we will carry along for a while because we're going to be on the right road for for a short part of this trip. You're going to come into Holliston. There are several houses along the way, um, many of them were there, but not as many as you might think. There were only about a dozen houses that were from here up to the next town line. What was, the, what was the population then? Population about then was probably about 1,500. Okay. Yeah, yeah, no, no, wait a minute. Well, no, maybe not even that. Um, I think it was, the, the, the problem is with the uh, census, they, they would, uh, for the most part, for the listing of population, would only list the uh, male, adult, the man. There were 237. <laughs> so, okay. so then, of course, we have young men, we have women, and all the other categories that go along with it. So that, it would be about that. Um, I don't have the figure right in my hand, but it was not very many people that lived along the main stretch, only about a dozen houses, and then the rest were all out on the farms every which way. So the thing is, when George Washington would come to a town, he would send on his emissary to go out there and alert people ahead. Did they do that in Holliston? We don't know. There's no recording of that but he may have come across here and maybe there was nobody out. It's possible. There weren't that many people here. So they would carry on, on through the town, and we would go up what we now know as Phipps Hill, carry up to there, no, no uh, traffic light up there, of course, at that time, and you would go through straight, and as you're coming around that corner where you have Underwood Street over here, you are now leaving Holliston and you are now entering the town of Medway. Who knew? So George Washington actually spent, oh, what we figure? 15 how many, minutes. 15 minutes. Yeah, we figure it was 15 minutes in the town of Medway. I'm not even sure how much Medway knows about that, but it's true. Then, it, it, and next time you happen to very carefully or be stuck in traffic on that curve by the Phillips gas station, Look over across the street, at the old part of Washington Street goes through the woods. You can see a little bit of it off to your right as you're going towards Milford. But that curve that we now take, was uh, that was changed in about 1900 because when the trolley cars came through, it was too sharp a curve to go on the old original road that George actually took. So carrying on, we come up the road a bit, and then we get to the one sure stop that we know that George visited in Holliston and that we did have at least somebody that was good enough to tell us that. And that was at Littlefield Tavern. And for all of you who have read the book, you might have uh, noticed that comment that was made about how he seemed never to be able to pass a tavern, that he stopped at Alden because that was one place that you could find out what was going on in the general area if you didn't find somebody outside on the street, which they probably didn't in Holliston. So, taverns were a central place of social activity. Uh, even some of our town meetings were held in the tavern instead of at the meeting house in the early years. So, taverns were very important. And plus, Littlefield Tavern was large enough and prominent enough to probably catch his eye. There's a pond next door to it, 
where the horses could get refreshments too. He took a map. And, and yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's the latest myth. Yes, yeah, yeah, the latest uh, myth, uh, legend, or lore uh, stated that, <laughs> well, George Washington then uh, took a bath in the brook right there. Yeah, but it was November, and I mean, <laughs> snow was being pretty. I don't think. I think it was the horses that's that partook of that. Well, and that's so, after you rested them in shade. Uh, yeah, that's, oh, that's and uh, yes, and that is also true about the Washington Elms, if you remember in the book, that uh, they had, that apparently George Washington admired the Washington Elms that were along Washington Street now, and looked up, and he rested uh, under the shade of it, and that's another problem, because it was November, and there were no leaves on the tree. But we're in the book for it, so <laughs> they do make a comment about it. Uh, unfortunately, that was something also that was stated in a lot of other towns as well uh, with the same uh, little bit of folklore that goes with it. But we get, we, we get all the way to uh, Littlefield Tavern, and we do know that people had mentioned it. Even the ta tavern keepers, uh, I think she was the granddaughter, mm -hmm. Jerusha, even mentioned it at her 96th birthday party. In 1865. Yeah, right. Think about that. So mm -hmm. she even mentioned, oh yeah, I remember George Washington coming by. <laughs> so she was just a teenager then. So we know that he was here. And then also we do have other notes to the fact that uh, he did stop at the tavern. Uh, he apparently had a drink of something. We're not sure what it was. Uh, but there is a tankard in the collection at the Holliston Historical Society, uh, which uh, was received many years ago with a little written note inside of the cup that said that this was the tankard that George Washington drank out of when he was at the tavern. So, fact, fiction, or folklore? No, we're going to take that as fact. <laughs> the handwritten note, and she signed it, so. <laughs> so we're going to take that as fact as well, yes. Fact, fiction, or folklore? Yes. <laughs> um, as a quasi-historian, um, I learned a long time ago mm -hmm. that, uh, well, the old saying is that hi history is nothing but myths that we all agree upon. Agree. Yeah. yeah. With that in mind, in my, in my lifetime, I have devoted myself to dismissing everything but fact when it comes to, but in this case, the Littlefield Tavern. Mm, yeah. I cannot even prove it was a tavern. Yeah. There's no license, there's nobody alive yeah. who remembers it as a tavern. Mm -hmm. The sign disappeared. Uh, but there is, a, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. In the mm. Historical Society uh, library, I ran across a receipt. <laughs> from 1818 written to Ephraim Littlefield, and this was a bill of sale for items he bought. Yeah. And the items are kind of interesting. I, I transcribed it down here. If I put my glasses on, I can probably read it. <laughs> 10 gallons of rum, four gallons of brandy, one gallon of wine, 33 pounds of sugar, <laughs> Somebody's making cider. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one pound of, uh, what kind of tea is that? Uh, su uh, Lapsang Souchong. Good stuff. Yeah, it's a high class tea. High class tea, yeah. <laughs> Two pints of gin and one weight of coffee, which I think was uh, probably five pounds. Yeah. His total bill was $26.92. <laughs> So I took one of the items, so to, we'll take the rum, and I, I bought this rum barrel in, which is a two gallon barrel, and he bought five of, five of these. He paid $10.60 for all five barrels. All five, yeah. If you take <coughs> liters, convert them to gallons, gallons, you know, split it amongst the barrels, yeah. that would cost you about $600 a barrel in today's money. <laughs> so he was not, this was not for personal use. He obviously <laughs> was selling it and watering it down. Yes, yes, that was the rumor that has come down through the ages that uh, his nickname was Grandma. Grandma. Grandma Littlefield and that he was accused of watering down the rum using the brook water apparently. But, mm. but the interesting thing in my, my studies about taverns is their, their role in the community yeah. was incredible. Um, you had two places you could hang out, church or a tavern. 
-hmm. You hang out at a church for one reason, and mm -hmm. everybody did, but you hang out at a tavern for a variety of other reasons. One of them is not rum <laughs> or food. Yeah. It is information, right. particularly mm -hmm. in, the, the, uh, in Massachusetts and the times leading up to the Revolutionary War. There was yeah. a constant stream of travelers coming from Boston through Holliston yeah. and going to Providence, Hartford, wherever they were going. Bring it, and they would stop yeah. for a rum or for mm -hmm. a meal. And with their dinner guests, they would exchange information about what the British troops were up to, mm -hmm. the tea party that just took place, all the things that were not readily available in, by any other means than by travelers. Mm -hmm. So if you wanted to know what was going on in Boston or Providence or whatever, that's where you went. Um, <clears throat> The tavern itself, it, it, it's interesting because I've been going through this revelation about when it was built, when it opened. None mm -hmm. of that information is available. There's, there's no right. facts. There's no licenses. There's no building permits. The yeah. only thing we do have is the fact that it was a land grant of 500 acres mm -hmm. uh, in 1660. Mm -hmm. we, I don't know if there was a, a building or dwelling requirement in 1660 if you were granted this land. But Duncan, who had the land, immediately, immediately started selling all parcels uh, to Adams and Underwood and all the various names uh, of people in town. And they continued to break it down, break it down, break it down. Now it's down to a quarter of an acre yeah. and 500. But if you can imagine, it went from basically Gorwin Street as it, on the north border, mm. about 109 on the southern border, t tapping the Charles River, yeah. wrapped around the present day uh, uh, Milford. And the eastern border would be Summer Street. And the western border is about, about 495. Yeah. Um, right. It's a lot of land. Before it was a tavern, it was, it was pretty much removed all the wood. You can see from this picture, and this is the 1930s. Yeah. There's about one, tr one tree, but you can see Paul Road didn't exist. None of the houses across Washington Street existed. And it virtually has, has not changed. But as best as I can tell, this tavern ran from about 1750, I think probably to Prohibition. And that kind of did them in. Then it became uh, uh, a home. But a public house, to me, it would be strange for me to open up my house where you, you live in a private house. These people chose to live in a public house where people could come day and night, mm -hmm. occasional rooms upstairs. Um, and that's, that's pretty, pretty much it. Uh, what uh, about uh, the swinging wall? Uh, there's a swinging, two of them. <laughs> yeah, the swinging walls, yeah. The top floor, the house, house was built in three sections. It was one room yeah. down, one room up. Mm -hmm. That was doubled to two rooms down, two rooms up. Yeah. A blacksmith shop was attached at the, the western end. Yeah. That was taken out and the second story was added to that, so it was built in actually four stages. The original uh, uh, base of the blacksmith's harp is still, still exists, and now it's a be they turned it into a beehive oven. Um, the dates of these buildings, well, Bobby Blair says 1688. And that's what he put on his pottery. <laughs> I'm still trying to track down where that date ca came from. Somebody must have put a you know, be in his bonnet and said it was 1688, I know. <laughs> well, I decided uh, last year that I was going to uh, have people from historic Deerfield, the other end of the state, they have a dendro, dendro chronology lab there, which is a study of tree rings. And they can come to a house, they can take uh, core samples out of all the beans, and they came and took 10 samples out of what I call, we call phase one, the original one room down, one room up uh, yeah. building. Uh, 
They took 10 samples. They can tell what year the tree was cut down by looking at the tree rings and comparing it with their database. And this is the 200th house they've done in Massachusetts. So they have an incredible database. Um, that information will be available tomorrow. So I will finally have a, a beginning. Tomorrow. tomorrow. <laughs> the check will arrive yeah. and then they'll release the information. But not until then. <laughs> but there's some very interesting things that they pointed out, like the hurricane of 38 appeared to have lifted off the back roof, the, the lean-to part in the back, because that was rebuilt in an eight or a 20th century style, yeah. using the original material. The whole roof line was raised up in the back, so it, as a salt box. So they would have enough headroom to put a door in. And still, I have to duck to go through it. <laughs> Ken, I'm sure you have lots of bumps on your head, too, don't you? <laughs> um, but the thing that amazed them the most, the guy who was running it stopped and he said, I've heard about this, but I've never seen it in 200 houses. Yeah. When they were building it, the corner posts, Support, the support all the, all the carrying beams for the second floor are guns, what's called gun stock. They go, they go up and right before they transition to the, the beam, they, they have a little extra plate there to hold weight. Um, hand hewed, except all of these in the house they discovered were hand hewed on three sides and sawn on the fourth side. And they explained to me that if you were building a house, you went into the woods, you cut down a tree, you limbed it, you dragged it out, and you hewed it, or you hewed it in the woods and then dragged it out. And if you had a four-corner room, you'd have to do that four times. If you hew the log double wide, when you pass by the sawmill, you have them rip it in half. You have two beams for one trip. You save money and save time. So that's what the tavern has, the original, the original part of the house. So we will know this time tomorrow night <laughs> when those logs are dragged out of the swamp. We'll be on the Facebook. <laughs> yeah. We'll have to do that. We, we'll get the word spread around. So um, yes, you, you call us, ask us, and we'll, <laughs> we'll see if we can get it posted somewhere. But I know, yeah, we're on the edge of our seats, too, yeah. you know, trying to see what's going on Well, with that. there's a couple of <laughs> people in town that say, oh, I've got the oldest house in town. Right, yeah, the same old, yeah. And I arrived in town and bought the tavern and decided I'm going to find out. <laughs> but there's nothing, there's nothing there. There's yeah. nothing to research. Right, yeah. I've been through yeah. county deeds, state uh, uh, information, yeah. and everything turns out to be a myth, which we all agree upon. Right. That's it. I, absolutely. I know there are uh, one or two other houses only. Luckily, you don't have that much competition uh, <laughs> around town uh, about it. Uh, yeah, some say it's a house on Ashley and Street, but um, and remember, I mean, building permits, surprisingly, were not a thing until the mid-20th century. You could put up anything in your yard in the garage or addition on your house and you did not have to have a permit and so when you go around town today and you look at the circus signs my one piece of advice to you is one warning is most of them are wrong <laughs> just you can yeah. start out with that piece of information uh, for instance and I notice there's a few mudvillians here uh, that there are a couple uh, there's a few houses in mudville that have 1800 signs on there and we know that there was nothing there in 1800. So it'd be closer if I went around with a paintbrush and went 1880. Might be closer. <laughs> but, but we do know, we do know uh, that there wasn't anything in that neighborhood because that was generated and inspired by the, the railroad coming through. And, uh, and, you know, and we are finding more and more history all the time. Uh, there's a lot of manuscripts unpublished in the Holliston archives and files which have never been seen, and we're beginning to go through them now uh, to see what previous historians had to say about it. 
and maybe we'll get a little bit more of that information out there. And there's some very, very interesting things that are coming out of these. Yeah, it really is. I read, I read one, I was reading one about the Littlefield Tavern. Yeah. It had little sketches that somebody did in the 1930s. Yeah. And uh, yeah. mentioning this blacksmith shop that is, was attached to the house. Yeah. And that kind of verified that in the 20s and 30s, anyhow, that still existed. And so we went and looked at it, and there it was. Yeah. But um, I flipped the page, and up oh, here's another drawing showing the front of the tavern, the set of stairs. And he mentioned that they were putting a new gas line oh. into the house, and they ran across two graves. <laughs> I thought, my God, I've got people b really buried on the front lawn. He had drawn diagrams of uh, the changes of the tone of the earth layers and the whole thing. And I kept looking at it, and I went, I've showed it to her. You can't what, believe what is it. This? i got to <laughs> dig up my lawn now. It turns out that this he was talking about the town hall yeah, right. <laughs> when they were putting the guests. But yeah. he didn't he he didn't switch gears when he left the tavern. <laughs> he went right on. He was the just town. Ramble, yeah, rambling, yeah, rambling through his on. notes. Yeah, but yeah. The, these are absolute yeah. pieces of gold mm -hmm. to a researcher. Yeah, we were reading uh, yesterday. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, about some deaths in in Holliston. <laughs> one of uh, one of the <coughs> deaths was a, a teepee caught on fire. He yeah. killed four Indian children mm -hmm. in the fire. Yeah, and about uh, a problem with horses too in the area. Uh, one, um, one early group that came out, Sherbin Holliston area, to survey their land. <coughs> they didn't expect to stay overnight, uh, but the horse ran away and they had to walk home. And <laughs> from the wilderness out here, I'm not sure exactly how far they had to go, but they were not very happy about it. So. <laughs> Uh, so you just get that picture of this wilderness out here, and they're out here like putting in stakes, and they're piling a few rocks over here to mark a, a spot. And then the, uh, then the uh, debates and the arguments would come out about exactly where all the lot lines were. And this is in the 1600s. And we have Winthrop's Pond uh, being uh, recognized. We're still working on um, the historical background on Wenakening. We'll report back once we figure it all out. Uh, and, but there's all these little bits of uh, Holliston and local regional history that we keep coming across. Now we did have one uh, little uh, bit of history about uh, <coughs> bodies buried and it had to do with the Littlefield Tavern and supposedly during the great sickness of the 1750s that a couple of bodies were buried in the cellar because they could not bury them outside. I don't know if you've checked out that aspect. I haven't, I haven't dug up the <laughs> but, uh, we, but we don't know because uh, all of this is a lot of hearsay yeah. also. It's, it's stories that were passed down over time and of course there's one big one that that really does come into. But before we get um, uh, uh, along on our um, you know, uh, journey through Holliston to finish it up. Can I, can I say one thing? Oh I yes you can. Yeah. Uh, ta in talking about taverns <coughs> oh, ta yeah. Tavern keepers, and you know, we, we all think of them historically yeah. as rowdy places and bar fights. <laughs> and and <laughs> if, you've seen, if you've seen the exhibit I put upstairs of all the stuff that yeah. was thrown away and discarded into Hopping Brook, there's a lot of broken <laughs> dishes and stuff, you know. <laughs> but looking at uh, Ephraim Littlefield, it was, there was a notion that in, in the state, statewide that if you were a tavern keeper you could they wouldn't give you a license or permit to run a tavern unless you were an upstanding citizen. Mm, yeah. Littlefield was a selectman, a sheriff, uh, what else was he? he uh, well was one of them, well, Eliel, uh, actually um, taught school for uh, a, a brief period of time at the little uh, Bragville school, yeah. you know, just a few uh, steps up from the house. <clears throat> but um, apparently he was fired from that position because uh, they felt that he didn't have enough democratic ideas, right. which I'm not sure what that meant. You know. <laughs> but, um, but there was, uh, you know, there were a couple of, uh, how many generations of Ephraim Littlefields? You know, they'd use the same name over and over and over Four. again. And there were Eliel's, and um, of course there was Jerusha, which uh, I loved her story on her 96th birthday. Yeah. That was marvelous. 
and uh, she was quite a pip. You know? But I, I just yeah. wanted to lay that, that rumor of taverns to yeah, rest yeah. a little bit. You simply could yeah. not operate a tavern mm -hmm. unless you were an upstanding citizen. I, yes, and Which plus I, also, though, I mean, fine upstanding citizen, yes, but remember the story about the two militias in town. There was the fine upstanding youth <laughs> who uh, they, they, uh, they sort of like bivouacked or whatever downtown, you know, on the muster field, which is now Green Street, and also they hung out at the Stone Tavern downtown, there's some Revolutionary War, and then there were the Rangity Dangs, remember the Rangity Dangs, which were sort of like, you know, the, 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 um, it was the men who were in the militia that were tall or fat and short, you know, all the mismatch. And where did they hang out? Littlefield Tavern, drinking the half watered down rum. And there are rumors they used to go in and drink the tavern dry. Dry, yes, after, that was their motto. After drill. <laughs> drink it and, dry. And that was during the era of, of uh, you know, after um, uh, the side of the United States that you had the local militias still. They sort of died out by 1850. They were no longer considered useful anymore. Maybe they just drank themselves dry. <laughs> and, uh, and it just fell out of favor at that time and there was no more um, you, know, you know you know like militia shows that would be down at uh, uh, Green Street or, or any place around it just and, and there were no um, Indian battles that they felt that they had to fight or any other wars it was a, a time of peace and so by 1850 we did not have those organized militias anymore you know, the, uh, that the, their name rang the dangs. Yeah, <coughs> the rang the dangs, yep. I've spent 10 years trying to find out <laughs> where that came from and yeah. what it meant. I've tried every yeah. language on yeah. the planet <laughs> to see if I could find a match. Right, yeah. So I'll give $10 to anybody who can answer Yeah, rang the dang, where does it come from? <laughs> I know. And it could have all been there. It yeah. was <laughs> probably some common notion, some, some common description of something, but it's, it totally yeah. escapes me. <laughs> I'll well, find it. yeah. Well, it's about that time in the 1850s. There was a, um, a, I guess it was a play. For instance, this is how these things come out. And it was called. It, it was a, a, a line in a poem, and it was supposed to be sort of like hurrah, hurrah, hurrah. But it was root hog or die. What the heck did that mean, too? <laughs> so, it's a marvelous thing. So, but what I'm going to do, uh, you know, just before we go on with the next part of the trip, I'm going to pass around um, some maps. <coughs> and so the fun that the, the one that looks very abstract is actually what Holliston looked like when George came through. Anyway, we're, we're leaving we're leaving uh, Littlefield Tavern now. And we're heading west. We don't know what he actually had to drink at Littlefield Tavern, and so as he's heading up the road, the first thing that George comes to, apparently, is a lock rock foundation that's standing there on the side of the road, not too far from the path by. And it apparently caught his eye. It was our famous balancing rock. Now here is where we get into that situation where fact, fiction, folklore, fantasy, or just plain fun. So far, in the search through Holliston records, we have not found any eyewitness accounts of George Washington getting up on that rock and trying to push it off. <laughs> We're still looking, but it's a story that has come down through the ages all the way to today. And when we were discussing this with Nathaniel Philbrick, we did take him there. And you know in the book, as you've read, that there is a picture of him trying to push the rock off like George. But we have not found anything in anybody's diary so far that said he was here. Now probably everybody was busy again. And of course, this is out in the middle of almost wilderness. So there might not have been any er um, eyewitnesses. So what I did was after discussing this with Nathaniel, I said, look, I'm going to ask around. 
and I did sort of a little uh, Hall of Some Man in the Street interviews, and uh, I would stop people and ask them, you know, whether they had lived here uh, a long time in Holliston or whether they were townies, as they were. And I got a good cross section. <clears throat> so most most everybody, you ninety percent of the people that I talked, to, oh yeah, 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 I heard something about that. Um, but if you had only lived in Holliston for a uh, short time, uh, many of them found out about it from their children because it would be a story that was told at the 18th century days, which is part of the school curriculum. And a lot of them would say, oh, yeah, yeah, my daughter told me about it. We went by and we saw, you know, and they were educated by their children to see it. The other group, the townies, and there was one in particular, which was a classic example. I said, hey, you know that story about um, George Washington and he, when he came through Holliston? And invariably they go, yeah, 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 and he tried to push the rock off. And I said, okay, where did you hear that? And invariably they would say, well, I don't know, it's just something they always said. So that is the classic example of a bit of, uh, is it legend? Did Ephraim Littlefield serve him rum that was not cut with the water? Did he have a strong one? He was in a jovial mood by that time. Certainly doesn't sound like it in his diary. <laughs> that he doesn't sound as though he had a wonderful time coming through town. But it is something that has been passed down. And like any um, other historical research, we keep looking and looking, and maybe somewhere we'll find a letter. Hey, I was outside in the yard, and I saw the, in the whole bit. But no, we haven't found that. But uh, legends and lore are just as important in local history as getting written down facts. Because as we know, that a lot of times, facts are written down wrong, too. So we will stick with our story. <laughs> of George Washington putting, put, <laughs> trying to push the rock off because it is ours. And uh, it has been around as long as we know. We have no idea when the story started. I have never even found anything yet in the town history that anybody even mentions anything about the rock itself, as if it was always there and it just was there. And it was not even worth mentioning historically. We're still looking. And, and, and now that it's fallen, yes, oh, we have a yeah. whole new group of folklore that's yeah. moving through town. Yes. Yeah. I've talked to three people who know who pushed it over. <laughs> yeah. One of them even told me how they did it. <laughs> of course, there was the truck truck traffic. <laughs> yes, and, and which it, vibrated off. Right, and speaking but, of that, yeah, the truck traffic and everything. Uh, when I was out there doing the interviews with a couple of news programs and we were standing halfway from the street to the stone and as large trucks went by, you could feel the vibration in the ground yeah. as the uh, large trucks went by. So perhaps it was erosion and also the problem that it was there, of course. Then there were the rumors that it was the blasting that was going on up at the, and I, I thought that's terrible. My gosh, could that have been the cause of it, of, of um, the blasting up at the quarry, just over the line in the Milford, and it's rumored. Well, there's um, several other large balanced boulders that are in the town conservation land over by the Milford line, and I was really worried. And I got up the next morning very quickly, and I ran out there to see whether any of those stones had fallen over because they were much closer to the blasting area and all of them are totally intact in their place. So I felt much better finding that out. A absolutely. Why? I don't know. It'd be interesting to come back to Hollis in 100 years from now and ask people, what happened to the rock? <laughs> Everyone's going to tell you a different yeah, story. That's right. It's, I love it. I love and, it. and we could start a few, Let's start a few. yeah, as, as some conspiracy theories of our own. <laughs> Be creative. <laughs> so, let's say that George did stop for a little bit of fun, tried to push the rock over, and he didn't. Now he's going to be passing out of Holliston. So where does he go from there? Well, he goes to Milford, where, uh, the, re where the, uh, the right reverend there uh, happened to be, um, I guess, mucking out the stalls in his barn at the time, and he saw George Washington come by, and he at least got to put in for an eyewitness account there in, in Milford. 
so we kind of lost on that. So this is a, another little um, challenge for you, for a fun little um, excursion to take to follow the path that George took. Now remember, when he was told to come this road, he was told it was the most direct route to Connecticut. He didn't want to go Route 20 because he had already come that way and you can't go back the same way you came. He could not go through Rhode Island, which was the other main road between Boston and New York City, which well, he, he was he trying to get to. He wouldn't go to Rhode Island. He, hmm? re he refused, refused to go to Rhode, Rhode Island. Refused to go to Rhode Island because he, they had not signed on. They had not on, ratified. Yeah, had not ratified the Constitution. So yeah. he wasn't going to go there. So he asked around and somebody said, no, no, take this, uh, this road right here, middle road, which he did. And you know the report that he gave that was not very shiny. But we can take it today. It is still there. When you travel on Route 16 through Milford, and you come into Menden, you come up the hill there in Menden, and you know all the car dealers all over here, you know, that whole thing. All right, you're going on Route 16, but you're going to now take a right turn on to Hart, uh, East Hartford Ave, and you will see some signs that commemorate the fact that George Washington took that road. Continue on. East Hartford, which then crosses over the main therapy, I think it's what, 122, whatever the highway is. But you're going to go straight anyway. You're going to go through that intersection, stay straight, and that road on West Hartford Avenue is going to take you right into Douglas, where you will pick up Route 16 again. He didn't take the long road all the way around. He took East Hartford and West Hartford. You come into Douglas, you will continue to go straight until you come to a four-way intersection. And Route 16 takes a right-hand turn to Webster. Don't go that way. Stay straight. And in a few miles, you will cross over into Connecticut. You'll see the large granite post. And it's really a short distance. Um, I tried it uh, one day, once I had gotten the whole route down. And um, I started at right in the square here in Holliston put my odometer to zero, drove the whole thing, and when I got to the Connecticut line, it was exactly 26.0 miles. Try it. Be, now. It'd be a good marathon route. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Yeah. And how far is Holliston from downtown to Boston? 20, 26. It's 26 miles. Is it? More, yeah, depending mm -hmm. on like you know which road. But what's interesting that out on the railroad, because the you know, railroad goes up here and it goes out like this on the um, the other sides of the triangle, uh, right there by Exchange Street, there is a granite post right along the rail trail with the number uh, 27 on one side and the letter B, right there. So of course the triangle going this way would be just slightly shorter than going up to Framingham and then on the train there. So we are just about equidistant between, you know, from Boston to the Connecticut line. And it's a nice little trip down that way. Uh, beautiful granite posts with C on one side and M on the other. And, and, uh, and that is the exact route that George took to avoid Rhode Island and go directly into Connecticut. And another thing, if you do happen to take that route and you happen to be a train buff, there's a lot of great stuff down there just in East um, uh, what's, um, Thompson, East Thompson, Connecticut. Beautiful rail trail down there with a lot of information on uh, the uh, historical train wreck and the, what was it, the southern trunk or what? You know, it's just marvelous. You've got to do it. It's really a whole lot of fun. Nice little Sunday afternoon trip. Doesn't take that long either. So, and it's a lovely route going through there too. So that's how. George happened to come through here, traveling that road. So, so and once we leave George, now we, I want to open it up to questions on anybody who might have um, some curiosity about that or when you read the book. Yes? Is Washington Street named after George Washington? Well, yes, it wasn't really a coincidence. And you will find that uh, quite a bit of it going along on Route 16 especially from Wellesley on. You will find Washington Street coming up uh, quite often. And you know, when you're in uh, South Natick, actually, you're on Route 16, but that's Elliott Street. Um, and uh, when you come out of South Natick, as you're going towards Sherbin, 
If you want to stay the route on, in that section, you're going to have to get up on Everett Street in Natick, which brings you into Sherbin, and then get over to 27. Now, the reason is, that, that stretch of Route 16 um, in Sherbin that goes through the swampy area straight through, and also Route 27 that goes from Sherbin in to Natick, those roads were not built because they did not build across swamps. You know, that took a while and a bit more edu uh, engineering into the 19th century before those roads were even considered. And that's why we have all these roads that go on the high land where it's more convenient in a way from uh, swampy and flooded areas. So, yes. You said that you have recently got some information on the old history that's new to you. Yes. Where did you get that? <laughs> well, the best cache of it uh, is uh, it's mostly uh, the historical society, and it's in the form of um, unpublished manuscripts by one of Holliston's um, 19, uh, well, he was born in the 19th century, but he wrote in the 20th century, uh, Daniel Chase, who lived in Holliston, and he wrote a whole, a whole bunch of these marvelous manuscripts where he would go out and thank goodness, he, he worked in an area of history that I probably would never have uh, even considered getting into, but he was very big into lot lines and, and uh, uh, changes of land um, and um, how it, it went from like you know say Duncan the Duncan Grant to somebody else's and how it was broken up into other um, smaller plots and he just had a whole lot of fun doing that and uh, he, he worked on that through the 20s the 30s and he retired to the Cape at the end of the 50s and he left everything here in Hollis and he retired down the Cape he is also the author of five novels and, and actually, it was quite long into my um, interest in the Daniel Chase files was that I got an inquiry by way of uh, Leslie McDonnell, who sent uh, you know, the question over to me. And it was from a um, British librarian who was uh, reconstructing, uh, re reconstructing a library in Britain that had originally been bombed during the Blitz. And he was going through the catalogs and everything, trying to come up with as much information on the books and the authors that were in that library. And so he sent me this note about Ernest Chase. Didn't recognize it. So I asked for more details. It's Daniel Chase. That was his pen name, was Daniel Chase. <laughs> his gravestone says Daniel Chase on it. He left Ernest back. A rather reclusive guy, but a writer. We have virtually no pictures of him. He seems to have um, avoided cameras. Apparently he had alopecia. The only one s sort of semi-sketch and photograph that we have of him, he has a huge hat on. Uh, he was part of the 1924 200th anniversary uh, committee for, for Holliston, but he's the only one that wasn't in the group picture. <laughs> so, uh, well, he, yeah, it was kind of interesting. Um, he, uh, he wrote not only the five novels, but he wrote um, articles for the Boston Herald and the Christian Science Monitor. He then got a government job during World War II, came back to Holliston after, after that stint in Washington, got married to Julia Tenney. They li he uh, grew up on Norfolk Street, and he also um, bought a house on Norfolk Street, and was there until uh, the time that he uh, retired to the Cape. So he's not, not technically a townie, but we have to give him an awful lot of credit for what he was able to do and the, the information he was able to dig up. He did not have the internet. He, sp he must have spent months in at the courthouse going through the old records because what he would come up with was all these little lot lines and about the people who came out here and had uh, plots of land like Samuel Sewell, for instance, who was a famous you know, famous historical character in Boston, e even during the Salem witch trials. Uh, there are other names of other people that you know, were famous and prominent in Boston who owned plots of land out here. He went through, digging through files about uh, Winthrop Pond, for instance, you know, who was named after, and all the little bits of information he threw in. And we keep coming across them as we're coming through them. Um, I have, um, 
I have gone through one of the, the manuscripts. Was, I picked out the shortest one because I could take, you know, uh, 20 screenshots on, on the folder. And then I have transcribed it so that it is readable and searchable and all that. But in it, he gives clues as to how he, uh, how he did it, where he went to look for information. You know, Middlesex files, Suffolk files, uh, archives, uh, Mass Historical Society. He, he was all over the place. I don't know when he had time to write, <laughs> for heaven's sake. And, but he would be coming up with these little bits of information and factoids. For instance, one that I um, immediately uh, sent over to Ben was just the, uh, the little throwaway uh, historical factoid that someplace out near the Littlefield Tavern, that area was known as Quichog, an Indian word. So he just thrown that into the files. Another thing to look up. <laughs> I can only imagine what he would have done uh, with uh, the search tools that we have now, where we can go onto the computer, for instance, and uh, with digital newspapers, the Boston newspapers are all, you can just go into them with keywords and look for whatever you want. For instance, just yesterday, you were asking me about uh, was there a coffee shop in Holliston? Because you had some clue that there was something about a coffee on, shop in Holliston. On eBay, there is a mm. traveling trunk, leather, <laughs> studded, you know, it's with the little brass tacks. You know, it's so big. Yeah. You open it up, and there's a label inside. It's got a it's got a divider in it. And it's got a label on it, which is an excellent shape. Yeah. And it's by a guy in Holliston who made trunks in 1824. Hmm. And this label is talking about he's moved his shop in town and is now across from the Holliston coffee shop. <laughs> Where is that? Yeah. Well, Where was it? We do know, I, I happened to find a, um, a little entry in one of the Boston newspapers. I got it in my copious file somewhere. Uh. But anyway, about a coffee shop that was formed in Holliston in the 1830s. Okay. Yeah. So we know. <sighs> somewhere in the square, I'm sure. It had to be someplace local. It wouldn't be on the backside. So I would estimate it's either along what we know as Washington Street or Central Street. Those were the two areas where there was uh, commercial activity going on. But I, I ran yeah. his name. Yeah. Nothing. It does, the man does not exist as a Holliston resident. Yeah. But and we're going to keep digging for him because they can the keep, search they is can not keep their trunk, too. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, you do find on eBay. Um, uh, over the years, uh, we, uh, I did acquire a large number of letters for, uh, that were written by Persis Johnson. Uh, who uh, lived in the house that we know as uh, Linda Vista, if you've seen the sign there. Uh, it was Nathaniel uh, Johnson who built it. Um, anyway, um, his daughter, Persis, who acquired the house after her father, and uh, there was a series of letters that somebody had and they put them on eBay. And thank goodness for Paul Guidi because I had no idea how to do it, so I let him uh, show me. <laughs> how we were going to acquire these letters because we knew that they were written by a Holliston resident. And they were written in the 1850s, 60s, in that time span. And, but unfortunately, uh, the, the person who was putting it out for bid mentioned in it that these were Civil War letters, Civil War era, Civil, you know, mentioned, just put in Civil War in it, and all of a sudden the bidding mm -hmm. goes wild. Yep. And so we were bidding for quite a while against somebody out of Virginia who was focused on that, and we we're focused on the Holliston part of it. And we, we paid over $700 for those letters because of that. How, how, how large a collection is that? As, oh, over 100 letters. Okay. Yeah, over 100 letters, all handwritten. Thank goodness she had good handwriting. And so we got the letters, not knowing exactly what were in them and everything. And come to find out, it had nothing whatsoever to do with the Civil War. <laughs> Most of the letters were uh, Persis sending uh, notes to her son. Um, she, uh, Persis was, was married to Samuel Smith, who was, uh, had, they had a son, um, uh, Frederick, and uh, the name L.E.P. Smith, for any old timers who may have known that name, well, uh, it would be, uh, uh, L.E.P. would be her grandson, but anyway. We get all the letters and everything, and all the letters are basically, 
When are you going to come and visit? How's okay. Helen and the kids? I have a barrel of potatoes we're going to send to you by train. You should get them to, and they're on and on and on. Every now and then there would be a little bit of history that would be thrown in about what was going on in Holliston, which would definitely be a much more interest to us here than it would have been to the yeah, Virginia he bitter. He, he lucked out. <laughs> he lucked out, yeah, he definitely did. He made us pay for them. but. But this is, um, these are the hazards that you run into when you're doing uh, a little bit of historical research that you don't know what you're going to come up with. I mean, just the other day, uh, somebody had sent me one on a series of <coughs> letters and stories and poetry and all this. And in it, it, it was supposedly written by somebody, a, a woman who attended the Bradford Academy, but the word Holliston is in it. So uh, I'm not getting, you know, I'm not going to get tricked twice on this. So, <laughs> so I sent a letter to the owner of this, I was putting the bid out, and I said, do you have a name on the person? What is it about Holliston? Why do you list it as Holliston? You know, what's it got to do with that? Is it written? And she, uh, the answer I got back was, I don't know. And that was it. I don't know. Well, I'm not bidding on it. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, but it is, it's, it, um, Doing historical research, especially on the local level, is an adventure all the way. You never know what you're going to come up with or where it's going to lead to. So um, with the, uh, uh, you know, sort of our party shot, I guess, would be that um, 2024 is coming up and it's 300 years of history that we have in Holliston. There is a lot that can be done about it, a lot of projects that are uh, being considered, uh, a lot of ideas that are cropping up. But one thing that uh, many of us had found is that we have a lot of work to do to educate people about local history and what is here right under our own nose that is valuable to know how it fits into, say, Massachusetts history, American history. And there's a lot of historical uh, facts and figures and people and, uh, that we don't know that much about and some of them that we're only finding for the first time as we go digging into the history. Lots of them. And um, I, I urge everybody to go out and take a look at history. It might be your house, but it is probably something in your own backyard. And, I certainly uh, have it in my backyard. Yes. <laughs> In your if, side you, if you haven't <laughs> been upstairs to look at yep. what's come out of the creek, I, yep. I encourage you to do it. It's the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. Um, yep. The little fields, I guess they didn't have trash pickup. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the, Thank ra the, the range of <laughs> items in there is just astounding. Yeah. Um, uh, another thing I, I wanted to point out, because finding this, this gem, found mm. another gem. This yeah. is the, the uh, receipt. Yeah. Mm. Apparently, the Littlefields, um, they took favor to taking indentured girls oh, out of Boston. Oh, yeah. Yeah, this is, yeah. And we found an indentured contract between the Littlefields. And I forget what year it was. Um, it was um, 17 1750. I think. Uh, 52. Right. Yeah, yeah. Because right when it's when they six opened years. the tavern. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 1750, yeah. Indentured six-year-old girls six -year -old from Boston girl. Named. Had, them, had them sign yep. this agreement. And it, it, it's incredible mm. to read. They talk about clothing they have to wear, where they have to sleep, uh, how long they have to be there. And this, this girl was there, obviously, for from six tw years old. Years. Yeah, six years until she was 18. And a lot of times, uh, <coughs> if, um, if she had um, had a chance to speak to Ariel Bragg of the shoe industry fame, who was also an indentured servant as a teenager, when his indenture was supposed to end up like a 21 um, for a young man, his uncle just kind of like forgot about it. And he had to really uh, push against his, his own uncle to, um, to let him out of the indenture so that he could go on his own and become the shoe manufacturer that he became. But Elizabeth Hunt, from what we know, mm -hmm. she came from Boston. And at that time, uh, they would have all these destitute or orphan children. And what are you going to do with them? We didn't have a home for little wanderers yet. Uh, that was 100 years later. So the, the, yeah. the selectmen of the town would petition the city of Boston to release children under an indenture contract. Yeah. And, and so you, we have yeah. one of those for the tavern. 
um, what, servants, what yeah. I find interesting yeah. is at the end of her 12 years, when she was 18, yeah. uh, what the Littlefields were required to give her as they released yeah. her from the yeah. indenture. They have a list of the clothing and the money and uh, a, sun, a Sunday pair of clothes and a working pair of clothes. It's just very, very interesting stuff. Yeah, yeah. But six years old. Yeah. yeah. What would they do? Uh, help around the house. Yeah. yeah sweep. Serve, sweep. Yeah. Who, who knows? Yeah. At some point, I'm sure they could they could work in the you know the uh, tap room and that that sort right. of stuff. Right. Yeah. But, um, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. one facet of, of our history that you just don't even think about. Never yeah. even think of it. Yeah, I know. Right here, and she was no doubt not the only one. Um, uh, the way that you know the welfare system, such as it is, that it, it, you know in Holliston it was done this way too. You gather up all of your poor people, the destitute people, the ones that could not um, you know survive on their own, and you have an auction. And they don't, and you auction off these bills. Okay, you want to take uh, Betsy over here? Well, I don't know. Let's show how much. And they start out with a, a price uh, for it, and then they work downward. So they would go to the lowest bidders, not the highest bidders. And uh, we have in the town archives at town hall uh, letters from people at that time uh, that were saying like. You know, you've dumped these people on me, and I, 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 can't, I can't support them. I mean, it's too much for me. I'm a widow woman, and now you've given me three people that I'm supposed to take care of. And that's how it was done. And they would just distribute them out amongst the people in town. And that was before we had the poor farm, which didn't come around until about 1829. And the poor farm, originally in Hollison, was located on land that is now Ashland. Uh, over in Fruit Street. The house is still there. And that was in 1829. Well, 1846, Holliston uh, had all that land taken away from them, 16, uh, 1,600 acres, including what was where the town poor farm was. But if you look at an 1875 map of Ashland that was put out by Middlesex County, there's a little block of Holliston stuck right in the middle of Ashland because Holliston refused to give up that poor farm until about 1892 when they took that long in town meetings to see if it is in the minds of the people to move the poor farm to within the environs of Holliston. And it took them that long until 1892 to accomplish that. Um. But until that time, Holliston owned a little island of land within what is sure uh, what is um, Ashland, and uh, Ashland's poor farm was just around the corner, actually, up on uh, a street just behind it. So that was the system on it. But in the beginning, indentured uh, servants at six years of age, all of the other destitute people in town, distributed out, and we're all going to like take care of it all together. That was the system at at the time that George was coming through. So. Any any other questions? Yes. Was that the only tavern in town? Uh, no. Um, Stone's Tavern was right in the square, and he was the son of the first minister. The son was. Uh, Russell's Tavern. Uh, we, we're not really sure the time span on them, but Russell's mm -hmm. Tavern was down sort of where the historical society is located. And they may have been only for like, you know, for a certain number of years. We're not really sure. We just hear tell of them from here and there. But those were probably the ones that, um, that were most likely. And, of course, they're on the main thoroughfare going through. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, that's a good. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, if they did, it would be probably just a routine of it. Um, not entirely sure. Uh, of course, um, you know, for a side story on you, know, where would you stay overnight in Holliston back in the colonial times? There is that one marvelous story, and this might have happened at the early Littlefield Tavern too. We don't know, but this was at the Jonathan Cutler House. And this was something that went on right up until, well, you know, 1800 anyway. Um, and the, the Cutler House, which still exists, um, 
that it, uh, that house also abutted onto uh, was then known as Pout Lane, which was one of the walkways of the Native Americans. Okay, and they would walk basically from like South Natick out to like Menden, Grafton area. And there were lots of pathways around, but uh, Pout Lane was one of them. And it would meet, uh, meet up with the old Menden path, which ran sort of where Route 109 is now, roughly where Route 9 is. But so Pout Lane was in the middle there and come right down, uh, right about the middle. Anyway, when the Native Americans walk along, and uh, they would walk single file on their way. And wherever they got, when it got to be evening and they're tired, they would very often just pile into the first house that they would come along. And we have several stories on this happening in several different places. And they would just walk right in, settle down on the floor of your, your home, and you just get out of the way. <laughs> You're outnumbered already. <laughs> and what do you do? You what do you do? Okay. Yeah. And Lay they were the used floor. to it. People were used to it. It was not an unusual situation. I had an ancestor uh, that settled in Oxford that we ran into the same problem uh, in her, her records too. And it would settle down. So Jonathan Cutler's off uh, to fight the Revolutionary War. He's in Boston. And he decides he's going to come home you know, on the weekend. Maybe he's going to pass. I don't know. He got home. So he snuck home to see how things were going. You know, how, was, uh, how were things holding up? And he arrives a little late after dark and everything, and he tries to get in the door. And he can't get in the door. And he can't figure out, well, why can't I get in the door? You know? And <laughs> so he runs around to the side, and it's late, and he knows that everybody sleeps upstairs, you know, in the loft. Okay, so he throws a few pebbles up, and, wait, and she it gets her, uh, uh, Mrs. Cutler's attention. She pokes her head out and says, why can't I get in the door? Oh, there's a bunch of Indians lying on the floor. And they would like, lie up against the door because you know, that was their security, all right? So he said, oh, OK, fine, all right. So he goes around, gets a ladder, climbs up, climbs in the window, spends the night, and they're gone in the morning. <laughs> so, and uh, having that, the, um, the Native Americans had a, a, a bit of a different understanding or um, understanding of private property because, uh, <laughs> hey, we're going to climb in and we're going to settle on your floor by the fire, of course. You know. and, but uh, there were never any stories about any um, uh, negative incidents on that. It's just, this is what you would expect if you were living along uh, or near a pathway. And you, you would have to expect that. So, so that's uh, the one overnight story that I can think of in Holliston. Uh, whether uh, people stayed over, uh, well, perhaps. I, I mean, mean, you I, know, I, I, I would expect so. I go back so. and forth. It, you know, it wasn't an inn. It was a tavern. Yeah, right. Um, yeah. And considering the size of the family that had to live in there, <laughs> they probably, had they all probably the didn't have room for but an occasional <laughs> a driver yeah. or a guest, uh, you know, right. or somebody in a storm or... I think yeah. something that's like, but to be, be open for lodging, I don't think that happened. Yeah, like a rooming yeah. N nothing like that until the 19th century, and yeah. then there was, uh, you know, the Hollis House, which was located right there where the Gulf Station is, <laughs> um, and and this road, this middle road, as they called it. Um, was still in active use as a way to go to Rhode Island and Connecticut still, and stagecoaches would come down, and Hollis House would uh, provide accommodations. I often wonder whether or not Stone Tavern also might have, uh, but uh, it, it was just not, I guess it was just not something we ha have either heard about yet, we're still digging through those records, you know, We'll report back <laughs> if we find anything. Well, uh, we're finding interesting things all the time still. Um, you know, the, the Daniel Chase files are a huge treasure trove of information. I mean, just on the first 20 pages that we have looked at so far, um, uh, we, we have found some really interesting things and in, uh, different ideas uh, of how to look at Hollis in history. So I'm in, in really... His, his files. His files it's are huge. This yeah, this huge. There's over 100. Well, as he reported to the librarian in, in, uh, upstairs in, in uh, 1955, he, he said he counted it as 90,000 words. I think he uh, underestimated. Yeah. 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 I, I'm pretty... Uh, no, not at all. They're all typed. They're all typed. Well, most, yeah, 90% of it is typed, and there is one handwritten notebook um, where you do have to adjust your eyes to his handwriting. Yeah, and what he did was that, you know, he would do these uh, typed up notebooks, and, but he would go around uh, with a, you know, a, a 
a pen and some paper and talk to locals. And that was the fun part. I love that part of that notebook because uh, you, uh, you could just see what he's doing. He's going around saying, so-and-so said that the house on Norfolk Street used to be located over on, and he goes on like this, and then down below him in parentheses, probably not. <laughs> I just love it. And, and he does. He's very open about the fact that, well, this is what I heard. Da, da, da. Yeah, this is hearsay. This is uh, the stuff that's written down, but this is what I've also been told. Um, maybe it is and maybe it's not. So he, he doesn't give you any false sense of security while you're reading through it. But uh, the first 20 pages that we looked at called the Hull Sewell Grant in the farms, um, you know, luckily it was the smallest one. <laughs> um, has really revealed some great history that we have otherwise not known about. Yeah, so stay tuned. And especially, you know, uh, for, you know, a little, you know, uh, extra note, uh, including some good history of all places, Mudville. He mentions Mudville at the very end of it as an aside, which is the, the, the jewels of this whole thing, those really beautiful gems that at sort of at the end of this, uh, that particular Hull Sewell one, all of a sudden, he starts to go off and digresses in talking about, like, you know, who put up the streets in Mudville? You know, why is it called, you know, the best one was Exchange Street. Why do they call it Exchange Street? <laughs> you know, and he adds that quote in there. And I've often wondered that myself. You know, where did that name come from? Well, of course, it's an Exchange Street in Boston. So he, a lot of the street names that we have here were borrowed straight from there. So, but yeah, I mean, and we're finding those little uh, digressions throughout all of his works. And some of them will probably come out in the publication that we're doing for the 300th. We're okay, starting together. Are the books here or are they at the historical society? At historical society. society. There's a few upstairs too. Yeah. Yeah. There's a few in the archives okay. upstairs. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we're going to have to do um, a sweep through both places to see. Because you don't know where he might have left off a few that, that we don't know about. Yeah. So it is. It's, it's fun. Yeah. So any more questions? Because we are pretty much on time. <laughs> I wonder if you're going to be selling any cider or ale. <laughs> oh, you came for the cider and the <laughs> ale. Yeah, this, I know. <laughs> this is full. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, 50-50. Yeah, yeah. In, in the tradition of. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for coming. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> oh. Thanks, Joanne. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs>